And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation plants, yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm, the s swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. That's the reading of the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn them to Genesis chapter 1. I hope you have your Bible. We are in this series called The Origin Story. Um, it, it comes from the, 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 the Hebrew Bereshith, which means in the beginning. Uh, if you looked at the Hebrew Bible, it doesn't say Genesis per se, it just says in the beginning. And so we just decided that as a church, we're going to take as long as it takes us to go through this text verse by verse. There'll be some pauses you'll see in April because in this house, we, 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 we at least honor the feast. And so uh, we'll have a, a Passover on the 15th, somewhere around there in April. And uh, we'll, we'll teach on the feast for a couple of weeks so that you can understand the prophetic nature and the historic nature of them. And, and then we'll take a break and do it again in the fall. Uh, there'll be another pause in there uh, where we have an, <clears throat> another a series coming um, really uh, uh, designed around what the church is supposed to be like. Uh, the working title is The Missional Church, and we'll, uh, we'll do that uh, in, in May. But outside of that, we're going to go verse by verse through Genesis, and so we've made it all the way to verse 9 in five weeks. I think we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll speed up some. Um, but let me just remind you that in the beginning, it, it, the scripture teaches is that God was intimately involved in creation. There's three words that are important. It says that he created, and, and that means he created something out of nothing. It said that he spoke and he said, light be. And, and at the sound and the mention of his word, the spoken word, creation took place. And then it tells us that he made, and it's a, it's a word that means his hands were intimately, intricately involved in the creation process. And so day one, we saw that light be. And, and then in day two, we see that God de de defines the heavens from the earth. And then day three, we see these land, sea, and, and the veggies. We've, we've taken a look at our text, and, we, and we've tried to look at it from the three perspectives. And we, and we use three people in our culture. The, the first person is Joe Rogan, Right? An atheist who, who, who says that, you know, people who believe in God are crazy, and I'm a big fan. I think he's on a journey that's cool. The second perspective we wanted to look at it from is what I would call uh, more of a deist, and, and we referenced Dr. Jordan Peterson and, and his thoughts on, on how he speaks into culture is a brilliant mind. If you've not read 10 Rules for Life, I think you should. And then we looked at Dr. Tim Keller, Presbyterian minister, and what he sees the gospel unpacking. And so we, 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 when we approach the text, we know that we approach it from three different places, either as an atheist, a deist, or a, a theist, someone who is, knows God because God wants to be known. So we had to address the old earth and firmanence and, and young earth and billions of years old versus thousands of years old. And what do we do with all of those things? And 
our response is we're just going to stand firm on what the word of God says. We're going to trust that, that, like in most cases, science will catch up to the word of God. If you don't know, I just want to remind you that for years, science said that the, that the earth material matter was, was, was eternal. And, and now they say that time, space, and matter had had a beginning and that God doesn't, is not somebody with, with lots of time. He, he, he exists outside of the confinement of what we have of time, space, and matter. And so we want to approach the scripture with that in mind. Now, God continues to teach us, and in, in, um, <clears throat> I, I want to say that what I'm going to teach you today is controversial. Um, you're like, are we at Nephilim? Not yet. It's Genesis 6. Some of y'all went on YouTube and are scarred, and it's okay. It's okay. Join the club. We're not there. But I believe what I'm supposed to teach, and I've wrestled with this for months. Matter of fact, it was out of my notes until about a month ago. I was just going to put it in the, sub, uh, the, the Bible study that we're going to do for this. And I was like, no, 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 no. I think our, our, our church can handle this. So read with me, if you will, in Genesis 1, and we'll begin in verse 9. And God said, this is him speaking again, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days and years. And let them, lights be in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so, what God said happened. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was morning and evening. On the fourth day. If we take scripture just at its word, he tells us the scripture, the creation story, when when heaven and earth collide. This is out of the most venerated text of of all of scripture. It's called the Torah. This is the book of beginnings. And and God tells us this, that he's going to give us these lights and he's going to give them to be signs for seasons days, and years. So the Father, in his infinite wisdom, put signs in the stars. What if I told you that the stars actually tell the gospel story? What if I told you in God's infinite wisdom, and we're going to get to it, I I don't even remember when, but it's coming. After the fall, Adam and Eve are asked to step outside of the garden. And, and, and God gives them consequences for their actions. And, and what if I told you that Adam and Eve start to behave in a peculiar way and they, they, they start to obey things that we don't know until the book of Leviticus, almost like they heard things from God. So what if the father in his infinite wisdom, as he walked with him in the cool of the day, what if he told them his story through his stars? Would that shock anybody? Like if an infinite God had the ability to communicate to his people and he wanted to tell his story to his creation in as many ways as he could through the living, you're a living story. God is still writing his story through the lives of his people. You are a living La Bible. You are a living Bible. And he's writing his story through you. So what if in his infinite wisdom, he wanted to make sure there was a number of ways for us to know and hear the story. Many of you are going to know what a zodiac is. Now, don't go and get stones from the parking lot. We're not quite there yet, okay? I'm getting nervous, all right? Scripture teaches us that God has named every one of the stars. So if they are there, they are not there by accident, which means they are there by design. And if they are there by design... What if he's trying to tell us a story? And what if, like most good things from the Father, culture has hijacked it, manipulated it, and made it idolatrous in witchcraft? Now, you might be surprised, but I wouldn't be. See, the word zodiac comes from the Greek, but 
There was a Hebrew word that is sodi. This is what I find fascinating, that through the Masoreth, what they called the sodi is actually in Hebrew defined as the way. Now, some of you are like the Bible. You're like, oh, my Lord, wasn't that what the first century church was called in the book of Acts? Yes, it was. They were called the way. And so what if for a moment we could just believe that the Father was going to put in the stars, which if you live in the city, we can't see them anymore, right? you got to drive out, right? <laughs> but what if he, we told a story? What if I told you that each of the 12 signs actually represented one of the 12 tribes of Israel? Would your mind kind of be blown just for a second? I think it's important for me to teach, so I'm going to go to. So if you have a seatbelt, put it on. Around each of the 12 sodi in the sky, there's also three constellations that are close to them. Um, they're, they're called deacons. Not a leader in the church, it's D-E-C-A-N-S. But I'm going to go through these rather quickly because some of you know what they are. Some of you might even look at them sometime. Some of you might even base the decisions around your life around this. And some of you know that the Bible says, don't do that. So you're like, why? So let's just look at them together. Okay. The first one that's uh, going to be in the newspaper. Ah, there's no newspaper anymore. Okay. Sorry. I mean, there is. If you read it, God bless you. Okay. Um, on the interweb, right? Uh, you might turn to the page and, and you'll see the word Virgo, which means virgin, comma, the infant, and the, the other decans around it are the desired one or the centurus or the dart-piercing victim or also the great shepherd or harvester. And you're like, I, I didn't know that. So the Hebrew Masoreth lets us see all of the constellations. And whenever I look to the constellations, my eyes don't make these shapes, okay? But let's go to the definition. So for the Virgo, it's the Virgin, the common infant, and, and there's a, a couple of those. And then the Libra. The Libra is, is a set of scales or a weighing. And, and the ones that are close to it are, are the, the crooks, the cross, the lupus or the victim, the pierced to death, the corona, the crown. You're like, Ronnie, I did not know all of this was in astrology. It is. And it's been stripped from the Masoreth. We have the earliest that we can find of a, a building being erected is, is, is about uh, uh, 2000 uh, BC-ish. There, there's one over in the Middle East. It's, the remnants are still there. But it was designed around this. And then there's the Scorpio. Woo! Sorry, I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to celebrate that or not. I was born in November. That's what I am. I would have been told anyway, okay? Which is no good. Then I'm the serpent? I'm like, oh. People are like, oh, he's, an, oh, he's a first child, and he was born in November. That's what's wrong with him. And now you know. The wrestling serpent, the biting. What's interesting in the, the Masoreth, in, in the picture, it actually shows that the original pictures that were drawn shows a serpent and someone's foot is on the serpent's head. I don't know where that came from. There's Sagittarius, who is the archer, liar, the eagle. Draco, the dragon, the old serpent is listed. Capricornus, I don't know all the, how to say all these, okay? But is the arrow, now, close to it is a Quill of the eagle and, and the dolphin, which there's some translational issues there. And then Aquarius, Aquarius, I don't know how you say it, okay? Then, and then there's a fish and the winged horse and the swan and then Pisces and Aries and, and it, it's this band and it shows a woman enchained and then it shows a crowned king and then there's a woman enthroned and there's a sea monster but there's also a bound lamb and an armed mighty man. I, I know this is all too coincidental. Let me keep going. And then there's Taurus, who's the glorious prince, and around him is Orion's river, and, and then there's a shepherd there again, and then Gemini, which is the hare or the serpent, and then there's Cancer, and then there is Leo. Now, the reason that I'm going to teach you about this today is because all of us 
have friends who are either looking into this or have looked into this or use this as an explanation of one of the reasons they don't believe God exists. And what we as followers of Messiah say is to know he wrote his story in the stars. He was, he told his story. See, if you do some research, and, and I've done hours, in, in culture, the names and, and, and the pictures are, are all relatively similar. But like I said, if I'm honest, I look at the constellations and I don't draw these shapes in my head. <clears throat> but if you look at these in the order of the brightest constellation to the dimmest constellation, and then you look at their meaning and their in the ta, in the, the the way they were defined in the Masoreth. I want you to see something for a moment. Imagine for a moment this story has been passed down. God is always telling stories from generation to generation as they sat under the stars. Now, before I do this, I know that there are dozens of verses, or at least three or four, that you would probably share with me. They would give you pause for some pastor even touching this subject as he goes through the book of Genesis. Some of you might think I'm a heretic, and I don't blame you. It might be for another reason. Uh, <laughs> but I, I want to see these things in context. If you have your Bibles, turn them to Deuteronomy. You're in Genesis, so it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a part of the Torah. It's the first five books of Moses. It's this venerated text that's been around. In the 18th chapter, it says this. When you come into the land that your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his sons or his daughters as an, as an offering. Don't you know in, in Canaan, child sacrifice was very, very common. And God says, hey, we, do, we don't do that. Even when you're really tempted to do so, it's not okay. Anyone who practices divinations or tells fortune, fortunes or, or, or interprets omens or, or sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead, for whoever does these things is an abomination. Big word means make God mad, okay? And because of these abominations to the Lord your God is driving them out before you. God says, this is what people do that don't know me. This is how people seek their future because they don't follow after me. Isaiah gives us another warning. He says, you are wearied with your many counsels. Let them stand forth and save you, those who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, who at the new moons make known what shall come to you. Behold, they are like stubble. The fire consumes them. They cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame no coal for warning oneself, no fire to sit before. I want to suggest something before I dive into this a little bit deeper. I would make the suggestion that the Father doesn't want you to not look at the stars, but he does want you to look at them to bring glory to his name. What I might suggest is that God doesn't want you to look somewhere else for your identity, your direction, your purpose, but he wants you to look to him to be glorified. So I would suggest that the warning in the text is for us not to look at the stars for guidance, for when we do, they become an abomination, an idol. But when we look to the stars for his glory, his faithfulness, see, we've seen that science is always trying to hijack the story of God. Now, for the record, I am not promoting astrology. I don't think it's healthy for you to check your horoscope. I don't think it's healthy for you to blame your birth month on your Enneagram number or your personality type. 
But the fact of the matter is, historically, all of the stars had names. So if they had names, they must have been important to God. And if they have names, they've had names for thousands of years. And I just might want to believe that God might be trying to tell his redemptive story to his creation through his creation. Psalms 147, the psalmist says this, he, speaking of God, determines the number of the stars and he gives name to them all. He's the one that passed down the names. Job, in, in, in the 38th chapter, he, he's been wrestling with God, and, and God responds to Job. He says, where's the way to the dwelling of light, and where's the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these he who brings out their hosts by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. To go back to the prophet Isaiah, he says this, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. Who created them? So what is his story? What is the names of the stars? So from the Nazareth. I'm just going to read them. The reason I didn't go through all of the names before, if you'd like that, I believe it's on social media. It's probably on the app. If it's not, email, text the church. <clears throat> if we were to translate Virgo and see it from the Nazareth perspective, it would say the seed of the woman, the desire of nations, the man of double nature in humiliation and the exalted shepherd and harvester. What If you look at it from the Nazareth perspective and you see the word liber and you see that it really, not the scales, but it shows the price to be paid, the crux or the cross to be endured, you see that the victim is slain and the crown is purchased. What if with the Scorpio, the conflict, the serpent's coils, the struggle with the enemy, the toiling vanquisher of evil? Sagittarius, the doubled natured one, triumphing. He gladdens the heavens. He builds fire of punishment and he casts down the dragon. What if Capricornus is life? Out of death, the arrow of God pierced and failing and springing up again in abundant life. What if Aquarius was life waters from on high? What if his drinking in the heavenly food, carrying the good news, bearing aloft the cross over all the earth? What if Pisces? is really about the multiplication of the Redeemer's people, the upheld government by the Lamb, the intended bride bound and exposed in the bridegroom exalted. What if for Aries, the Lamb found worthy, the bride released in making ready, and the serpent or Satan bound, breaking triumphantly. What if for Taurus, it was the invincible ruler who was to come, the sublime vanquisher, the river of justice that we all walk through, and the all-ruling shepherd. What if for the Gemini, it was actually not just a marriage, but the marriage of the lamb, the enemy who becomes trodden, the prince coming in glory and the princely following after him. What if for cancer, it's this possession secured? What if the lesser of the stars, and I didn't get into that description, but the lesser is for the firstborn of the church. And what if the greater fold, the lesser fold in the greater fold? What if the lesser fold might be the church and the firstborn of the church? And what if the greater fold is Israel safe folding into this everlasting kingdom? What if for 
Leo, it's the king rending or reigning, the serpent fleeing, the bowl of wrath upon him, and then the adversary or the serpent's carcass devoured. Gang, this is the gospel story. The Messiah to Revelation. It is a narrative of, uh, it has references, if you will, to what we might call apocalyptic literature. And all of this is written. These were passed down and then they were distorted. And then we have what we call today astrology, where people are looking to the stars for guidance instead of looking to the creator of the stars for salvation. It's been hijacked. We can see the gospel in the stars. Now, I, I, like I started, I, I admit that some of this is controversial. You, you might find different definitions, or there might, you might find something that, I'm just letting you know that from a Nazareth perspective, something that was passed down for years. Let me just tell you how good the Nazareth perspective is, just as a reminder. The Nazareth perspective is, is passed down from generation to generation. And there's this young kid, he's pretty smart, good looking. And when a conquering kingdom comes and takes over Israel, he, he's taken into captivity, him and a few of his buddies. His parents, they did, his friends' parents did not like him, their children, because they named them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm like, I'm serious, kindergarten would have been awful. And Daniel is with his four friends, and they go into captivity now in Babylon. Now, in this time, some of you that maybe have some exposure to the church, this is where the Daniel and the lion story comes into play. You should read the story. If you're new to church, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're the story of the three guys in the fiery furnace and how God saved them out of that. And that's where these stories came from. But this guy named Daniel raises up and becomes so influential that he serves as the prime minister for three different kingdoms. He was valued. And Daniel gives a mathematical equation, a, a prophecy. And in his prophecy, he tells us the exact day that the Messiah would come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Matter of fact, if you've read the New Testament, when Jesus said, The reason he was so broken was because you did not know this thy day of my arrival. Because you've been given. Tradition teaches us that Daniel also set a group of men to glorify God by watching the stars. And Daniel told these men generations later. He said, in generations later, you will see a star. And when that star moves and covers the light, you will know that the Savior of the world is being born. Dear friends, three, didn't, three people on camels didn't go strolling through Bethlehem looking for Jesus. This would have been an entourage. Think escalades, rolling through town, black tinted windows with gifts for the king, looking for the Messiah. How did they know that? Because the story of the gospel has always been written in the stars. It's been hijacked. It's been stolen. And now people look to the stars for direction instead of looking to their creator for salvation. Dr. Chuck Misler, uh, a pretty brilliant dude, and I'm going to try to elaborate on this quote, but he says, God's greatest achievement is not his creation. I'd be like, well, hold on. If you look at the creation, look at it. Look how vast it is. Look how unique it is. And Chuck Misler would argue that God's greatest achievement is not his creation, but his greatest achievement is the redemption of mankind. Dear friends, when he spoke and created and made, he had this gospel story in mind. When he created and he made before the foundations of the world, you were on his mind. What does this mean? This means that God waited with great anticipation and expectation for your arrival so that he could be in intimate relationship with you. 
down through the years, he said, I can't wait until you get here so that you can know me and I can know you and you can make me known. That's why we exist. The creation story is that a starfish brings more glory to God because it exists in its purpose and does what it was created to do than mankind does because we were created to make much of God and glorify God and serve him. And in what we do is we serve other things, good things. For those of you that are watching online in America, I know there's people from all over the world that do, but here... Our, our idols are comfort, convenience, and control, and we worship them. The story of the gospel is that he wants to redeem you. He wants to be in a right relationship with you. See, the creation story gets some chapters in Genesis, which we've been working through. The creation story has some uh, chapters in Job. It has a few chapters in Isaiah. There's some Psalms that give us some clarity around all of that. But the witness of all of scripture is the redemption of mankind. It is a holy God making a way for an unholy people. Yes, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the enemy will always try to distort the truth of God's revelation. It brings us to day five. Day five in Genesis, it says, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heaven. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, which swarms and which with the water swarm. It's really easy for me to say the W's and the S's and the R's. I'm like, yeah, thank you, Genesis. All right, here we go. Verse 22, and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening in the morning on the fifth day. <clears throat> We're going to jump down just a little bit to Genesis 1, 20, verse uh, 24 or uh, 2, 24 and 25. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And in, in this day six creation, we see the creation of man. And we're going to get to that next week and the image that we bear and the responsibility that we have. But what this portion of scripture does, which so many of the portions of scripture that we've read have, it really does cast doubt on evolution. There's a bunch of reasons out there that people say the earth isn't billions of years old. There, a matter of fact, I was reading, because you guys know I've been reading scientific journals because I'm, I'm trying to keep up and make sure that I'm not a crazy person. But this week, I'm, I'm trying to give you a new thing from Scientific America. This week, they've now decided that the T-Rex wasn't the T-Rex, that the T-Rex and all of the fossil record is actually at least three different animals. Do you know how disappointed I am? It's one of my favorite dinosaurs. Like, I wonder how he did with his little hands. I, I, don't, I want to believe that he wasn't a meat eater and he just walked up to trees and went, uh, I don't know if that's true, but it's what I wanted to think, like his little arms. And now, apparently, as science continues to catch up with itself, this is what I mean. We don't have to believe, I don't want to call it garbage, but we need to teach our children that they were created in the image of God, designed by God with purpose, dignity, worth, value. Now, what evolution means, now for those of you who are new around here, you're like, my Lord. Listen, I, I, I'm comfortable with micro. If you want to tell me that a bird's beak changed, me and Darwin, same page. If you want to tell me that the feathers on the belly, like if I could change my belly, I don't want it to change colors. I just want it to be slimmer. So I'm a very slow evolutionary process happening right before your eyes. We, what I'm trying to say is evolution says, this, I want you to hear me. Evolution says that a Great Dane can produce a parrot. You're like, well, Ronnie, that's stupid. I know. What I'm trying to explain to you is that evolution says that a new species can come from an existing species. A new breed of dog is not evolution. That's called inbreeding. Right? 
You have a chihuahua? Just kind of a dog? Okay. You have a German shepherd? My mom has chihuahuas. If I offended you, I'm sorry. A chihuahua and a German shepherd? Mate, you don't get a mice. Right? But that's what we're taught. Donnie says he's going to try later. Okay, here we go. Let me know how it works. Okay. The diversity of animals and they have uh, similarities in structures do not point to evolution. I believe it points to a common designer. In Darwin's life, as a matter of fact, this is one of his admissions. He says, the most obvious and gravest objection which can be argued against my theory is the fossil record. That was a hundred and something years ago. Scripture boasts. It says all races, all animals, all people were created by God. There is no proof of a new species, only behavioral modifications, the best the fossil record can show. I'm closing. Like some of you had, like, oh, we're getting out early. Maybe we'll see what the Holy Spirit does. Christianity is not the enemy of science. Christianity is the hope of humanity. Christianity, we're not anti-anything. But we are pro being reconciled to God. So what do we do with this? If you have your Bibles, go to the New Testament just for a moment, okay? It's 2 Corinthians. If, if you're new around here, the, the reason we read this book, it, it was collected by people who are following after God. And, and after Jesus died, there were some leaders in the church that were trying to make sure that his message got to all the world. And so they started collecting his story, and, and that's what we call the Gospels. They're just a, a retelling, a reframing of, of the same story, and that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then there's this book called Acts, and it's the Acts of the Apostles. It's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit, and it shows us what happens as the church first gets started. And there's a guy that's mentioned in that story. His name was Paul, and he traveled around, and he tried to bring encouragement to the church, and when the church was acting crazy, he tried to say, hey, y'all are crazy. I mean, and he kind of wrote it out. This is one of the letters that he wrote to a real church that was really going through some stuff. But he wanted them to know who they were. And so this is in 2 Corinthians. So if you, I hope you found it. And this is in chapter 5. In verse 16, Paul's trying to explain to this church. He's already written them one letter. That's what the 1 Corinthians is. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. See, when we become in right relationship with God, we are sozo. It's a Greek word that means made whole. We're born from above. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. We no longer see him through eyes of the flesh. We, we see him with spiritual eyes. So he's trying to remind us who we are. So this is what he says. He says, therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a, a new creation. He actually uses the Greek word metamorphoso, metamorpho, and it's the same word that, that you and I get. Metamorphosis, it's, it's what a butterfly does, right? It, it, we're a new creation. He says, the old has passed away. Dear friend, I don't know what you might have brought in here. I don't know what you were doing last night. I don't care, and neither does the father. He just wants to be in right relationship with you today. I don't know what's in your past that you might think, God, I, you, me? You, you, can't, you can't be in love with me. No one loves me. No, 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 he does. And he waited with great anticipation for your arrival, and he wants to be in relationship with you. And then he says this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How does this happen? You're like, Arnie, I've tried. I've tried this Christianity thing. I've tried this morality thing. I've tried to just like hold on. What do, what do I do? He says, listen, he said, all this is from God. This isn't a work that you get to do. This is just a gift that you get to receive. He says, through Christ reconciled us to himself. Remember the greatest story, the greatest thing of God is not his creation. It's his redemption. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, us as the ministry of reconciliation. So now that we've been known by God and we know God, we make him known. He says this, 
That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors. Everybody say ambassadors. Ambassadors. I, I want to pause here. Do you know what this means? This means the same rights, the same privileges, and the same responsibilities of Jesus has been bestowed upon his church. That means when we go into the workplace, we represent a different kingdom. When, we, when we, we serve among people, we represent a different kingdom. See, yes, the kingdom of heaven, if you've read the book of Revelation and it terrified you, yes, Jesus is coming back. But right now, we are ambassadors with the same rights, the same privileges, and the same responsibilities to usher in the kingdom of heaven. And it's why when people see that, that they marvel at God. When we live as these people of reconciliation and are trying to make right all of our relationships, the world around us, his mind is blown. And then because of the way you live, because of the way you bring, into the, bring the kingdom to your workplace and to your family and to your friends and to your employees and into your boss, the way you bring and usher in the kingdom, everybody around you begins to glorify God. See, this is the hope that we have. This is the responsibility of the, this thing called the ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Greek word for church. It's, it's the gathering of God's people into a movement to bring the kingdom into their workplaces and into their families. And then he says, why? Keep reading in verse 20. God makes his appeal through us. God is making his appeal to the world around us through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For his sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Dear friends, you can live a holy life. You don't need the bondage and the baggage. You can be free. That's what he wants to do today. He wants to make all things new. When we look to the stars, we don't look to the stars for the answers for our life. We look to the stars to the answer of life. Jesus is talking to a professional religious person. His name was Nicodemus. He was one of the most 70 influential men of his time. He was a part of this thing called the Sanhedrin. It's like a Jewish Supreme Court, but it's much bigger. And Jesus says this to him. He says, God loved the world. The Father loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He says, the Father did not send the Son into the world to, to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. What is saved? Saved is you surrendering. Saved is you believing. The reason we gather is because we believe that Jesus is alive and well and he resurrected from the dead. That's what makes us Christian. And so we believe that because of that, we have the power to become, not our power, through the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to receive his power and come into right relationship with God. If you've never done that, right where you're sitting, we just say, Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he was raised from the dead for my sin. Will you make me whole?